Welcome to the Automators Podcast with your host, Jackie Stook and Joe Glines. Hey, everybody. So today we are going to talk about how to measure the benefits of your script with a time study. Hey, everybody. It's Jackie from Copenhagen. And Joe from Dallas, Texas. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about how to measure the benefits of your script with a time study. And one of the things is, and, and we've probably talked about this many times over, Joe, is don't measure um, <laughs> your ace worker, right? Uh, you want to get an average person um, so that you have a, a fair comparison. Uh, your your script or your automation will probably beat almost anybody, but um, why not get the best um, example out of whatever you measure? Well, you want to, yeah, and, and to just to rephrase that, the, the best meaning the most representative, right? It's it's the most the thing that you're most likely going to be uh, not replacing, but I guess maybe it's a way to say it. Um, but but doing instead, right? And that's so. If you got your top performer, um, it would it still wouldn't look as good. But why would you compare yourself only to the very best, right? So pick someone who's you know more in the middle of the right, or or do all of them and then take the average. Yeah, I, I'd say I've I've made a um, a time study like this a few times before, and even presented it to management and stuff like that. And one of the things that really makes stuff like this take off is, um, sure enough, using the average person, but uh, it would also be how many times a day do they actually spend doing the activity. And if if you take that into account, people seem to forget how often they do small things. I remember making something that helped people print Maybe people ain't printing that much anymore, but at the time, there were 20 plus employees who were printing maybe four or five times a day uh, from the same system. And it was a daunting task of going to one window and another menu and choosing and then viewing and accepting the preview then going through the next uh, few options and then getting another preview until you actually open the menu where you could then choose to print and then accept that you truly wanted to print. And then you would view the actual print that would then start printing when you said okay to that. So it was just amazingly bothersome to actually print because you were just almost accepting that you wanted to print four times it was totally outrageous and it was happening in a browser so as soon as they had actually clicked print a fully automated script could take over in the background and they no longer needed to actually look at all these confirmations and and uh, previews and it just blew up how much time they actually used on it it's awesome. Now, the other really cool thing about AutoHotKey is, let's say, <clears throat> in the example you gave, Jackie, you already you had pretty much knew you wanted to automate that process, right? Uh, but what you could also do with AutoHotKey is, hey, you know what? Before I'm going to automate this thing, I'm just going to write a script that's going to look to see how often this window, how many times a day this win one window comes up, right, and have it running in the background and. That way, before you spend a lot of time doing the automation, you first, not clarify, but um, can make sure that it's worth the time because, oh, actually, like after two weeks, this person's done it 50 times. Oh, you know what? It's, a, you know, it's far more or far less than we thought, but uh, help you understand if you should be automating something. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to this one, um, if you could also put it on multiple people's uh, environment or... Right that one thing that everybody went over and used. And by not using a single person as, as your base, um, yeah, absolutely. That's that's a great one because then you could actually take um, the average or the median uh, from from not just doing one sample. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's another really big one is, uh, you, you know what, if 
especially if you tell the person, if it's you or you tell the person we're going to be doing this, they're going to be, their behavior isn't going to be the norm, right? They're going to be really trying really hard to do it as fast as they can and always be on it. And what you want to do is to really represent the real world kind of what's going to happen. So you also don't want to say, have everything else closed, only work on this. You know, you want to have it where it's more of a real world environment where the computers at the same speed it normally is. Like an example of this was when I was at TI, the IT group that builds websites, um, they created a whole new way for stuff to work. Um, and they were doing a test with uh, employees instead of customers, but still they said, you know what? We were on an internal network and in the real world, customers aren't going to be on that network. So they purposely slowed down the speed of their browsers and stuff to where it was more of how it was going to really work for, for customers. And I thought, I'm like, that is brilliant, right? Because you really might think this thing is awesome, but it's not a real representation of how it's going to work in the real world. And your, you know, your results would be very misleading. So this is why you want to make sure you kind of um, do multiple tests if you can, do it different times, and try to make it as best rep rep you can to represent the real world of, of what it's going to be like. Yeah, I've, I've seen this example many times over. I've recently seen it with something that should be a mobile uh, accessible uh, utility in a browser, but for some reason the developers seem to have only tried to use Chrome's developer tools to see how it looked on a mobile device. So when it actually went out to to real devices, their uh, thing didn't look all that right. It was okay, but still some stuff where we're like. Mm. If you had actually tested it on a real device, you would have immediately seen that this was an issue. But yeah, I'd, I'd say we also have one where focus on uh, your task and repeat, right? This one is more of keep track of the time that the person you're measuring uh, when they're doing the activity that you want to uh, repeat or, or optimize or whatever. Right, so don't measure how many emails, let's say Sally does in a day. Keep track of how much time she actually spends reading those emails or uh, replying to those emails. Because uh, a person like uh, Sally here, uh, she'll do lots of other stuff. She'll shift to other tasks, she'll go and get coffee. So you can't just use Sally's entire day as your time reference if you're only trying to automate her email uh, reading or sending. Yeah, so let, let me help, like, so my background in data science stuff, right? This really comes up with regression analysis. And you want to control for other factors, right? And, and if you didn't do that, you'd have this so much more variance in your data because you didn't isolate it down to just you know, the specifics of what you've done, right? What you're measuring. And in statistics, you have a different way to control for this. But what we're saying is make sure you isolate and just, you know, measure the time that's actually working out that when she's doing the stuff that you're measuring, don't just take her entire time. Because even though on average it would work out, but it would have a lot of static, a lot of fluff in there and make it harder to really notice those differences. Yeah, uh, this last one, oh, go ahead. Yeah, it can also be hard to um, record uh, as as a program or script. Um, so sometimes some stuff like this need to be observed. Yeah, right, right. Um, and, and and again, part of it, I think it's there's the actual time study where you're measuring your comparison of how you're doing compared to her doing it. But there's also a different aspect of this, which I talked about earlier, is just when you're deciding what you want to automate, right? Like that's when also just watching behavior uh, is a really great way to start understanding where people are spending their time or writing a simple script to just get the active window and saying how long it stays active, maybe checking it every 10 seconds or something, right? And keeping track of that can help you see where people are spending their time and, and help you decide, you know, places that you might want to automate in the first place. Now, the, the last one, which is, uh, I'll let Jackie talk a bit more to it, but in auto hotkey, you know, it, it is, if you want a precise measure between two events, uh, you're better to use the A underscore tick count method because it, it gets it down to the millisecond precision. Um, 
it, you know, this to me, it it's more when you're optimizing scripts and seeing how comparing between them. But I just did want to mention it in the podcast just because why not get the most accurate representation of time, right? Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd say something like this is it, it might depend on how time sensitive two events are. Uh, but but yeah, it, if the stuff is happening enough times, actually determining if stuff happens within uh, those small millisecond chunks that out of hot key is normally built to measure or if um if you are losing seconds upon seconds because whatever task is happening um just eats up at that one uh, wrong measuring uh, parameter sure absolutely make sure to pre precisely determine um the elapsed time between two events because you can, as the one trying to show the benefit of the script, have a lot of lost um, time from the script just pausing or putting in unknown times between uh, what it's doing. So uh, to close out of here, let me let me give an example of when, when I was at TI and I would automate something like I had to upload contact list to our vendor for emailing in the process it, what i did was i i would hit a timer basically manually start the timer and manually i would go and do that upload process but the thing is there were different steps i'd have to wait for the page to load and sometimes it takes several seconds and so i might get doing something else so i forced myself to say okay i'm going to focus on this uh, while i do this and get through it. And it took like seven minutes to upload this, but I, I did this test multiple times and I saw there wasn't a crazy amount of variance where I'm like, you know, it's, it, as long as if you, if you see a lot of variance in your, your measures, then something's probably wrong, right? Like with what you're doing and you need to really go back and maybe drop out one of the outliers, one that was really, really high and go, you know what, something went wrong and that one, the person got distracted or whatever. Um, and, and then take the median maybe, which is a nice way to help not have these big averages have a large effect. Um, and then the, the part with the auto hotkey side of, of measuring the time is so simple, right? Because it's you're, you actually have a hotkey that's measuring exactly the, the time for it. So uh, it, it focuses and stuff. What was interesting is like in that example, it went from like seven minutes to manually do it to like less than two minutes to having automating my browser do it. And then I learned they had an API call, uh, an API end service web service that I could connect to and that got it down to basically I hit the hotkey and it would take you know I mean I was done let's put it that way it took about 30 seconds to finish but it was all behind the scenes and stuff so it was it was like nothing <clears throat> yeah and that's that's where timing the stuff behind the scenes can be really important because if Sally is doing it and she has loads times and she's sitting there looking at the screen waiting for the next button she can click if if that's the biggest time sink, do look for other ways to get to the end point, um, like an API, as you found, or move it to the loading happening in the background and stuff like that. I've, I've seen people look at these time um, loading auto, uh, animations, but not doing anything on the computer even though the loading out animation is happening in word and they actually need to go and answer a few emails they wouldn't right. switch the program because it's loading uh, it, and stuff like that is something that you can really get uh, around with with scripting for sure. yeah yeah and, and uh, just to reiterate though <clears throat> when i was doing that it was even when I focused really hard, it's I got it down to like seven minutes. But it was so much of that time, Jackie, was it would actually be ready for me to go. And I'd, I'd wait like five seconds. I mean, it was just little things here and there where you just get, I don't even want to say distracted, but when you start automating a browser and it can go as fast as it's ready to go, it is insanely fast. I mean, an API web service is faster. Don't get me wrong, generally speaking. But wow it's so crazy how fast you can automate a browser yeah awesome well thanks everyone let us know if you guys 
do these things. Uh, maybe someday, if you want, we could we could do like a recording of how, uh, really like demonstrating it, what we're doing. But I don't think it's a too rocket science of a concept. But I'd love to hear your feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Let's hear. Cheers. Bye bye.